Um, yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for joining um, today. I'm really excited to tell you a little bit about the research that I am doing, but also just give to give you a little bit of a general overview of specific interesting aspects related to sea level change. And here this picture in the front is a picture from Barbados. I, as Mike mentioned, I promise to take you in the field. I will show you some of the, some of our field work, which has taken us to um, Bermuda, Barbados, Bahamas, Greenland, and all over the place to measure and understand sea level today, but also in the deeper geologic past, which I will talk about um, today. I think sea level rise and sea level change is not really a topic today that needs big motivation. Um, it's commonly understood that sea level rise is a pressing issue that affects coastlines around the world and it affects people that live around the um, uh, live on coastlines around the world. But nonetheless, I still wanted to throw up a couple of graphs and figures just to give you a little bit of a sense of the problem that we're faced with. Um, what you're seeing here is the number of people living on land that will be flooded if sea level rises by one and a half to two feet. And of course, you see there's a lot of this uh, affects the US, South America, Southeast Asia, very much so, but also essentially most countries that have a coastline. Um, and the numbers are in the millions of people that will be affected by sea level rise. And this is relatively this is not a huge amount of rice, right? One and a half to two feet. Um, so clearly cities along the coast will be affected. Um, if we zoom into the US, a slightly different um, scenario here, number of people affected if uh, or at risk if sea level rises by three feet. And you see, of course, everywhere along the coastline, especially areas that have very flat topography like Florida, New Orleans, Louisiana um, will be affected by sea level rise. So what my work and the work of many, many other people aims to do is better understand why is sea level changing the way it does, how much is it changing, and how will it change in the future. And today I will give you a little bit of a, an idea of some of these different aspects. And um, I might focus on maybe some of the, I give you some overview aspects in the talk, but also just some sort of niche topics that are specific to my research um, and are hopefully still interesting to you. So here are the four topics that I want to talk about today. I'm going to start by talking about um, what is the rate of current sea level um, rise and what are the main drivers for that. And then we'll look at the specifically along the US East Coast and we'll move away from thinking about sea level as a global mean sea level change and think about how does it change from one place to the next and how, why is that so different, especially along the US East Coast. Then in the second part of the talk, I'll look more into the future. I'll tell you a little bit about predictions specifically for New York City, what predictions are for future sea level um, change. And then um, tell you a little bit about the field work that we're doing that reconstructs sea level in the past specifically in time periods when temperatures were warmer than they are today. Um, and therefore, these time periods serve as analogs in which we can study how sensitive are ice sheets in the past to warming and therefore possibly in the future to that same amount of warming. So that's ahead of us today. I'm going to jump right in and start talking about um, rates and drivers of current sea level change. So the way that sea level change is measured around the globe is predominantly through two different means. One is sort of seen here on the left, which is through directly measuring sea level through tight gauges along the shoreline. This gives you a sense of the distribution of tight gauges around the globe. So essentially almost everywhere where you have a coastline, um, you have a tight gauge that measures sea level. This is the tight gauge in Battery Park. I will actually show you the record of that a little bit later. But next time you're down there, keep an eye out for it. I actually haven't, I didn't take this picture. Um, I stole this off the internet, but next time I'm down there, I should take one myself to have to put in here. The other way that sea level and sea level change is being measured is through satellites and specifically and most importantly through satellite altimetry. So satellites literally just measure the surface of the, the sea surface and through repeat 
surveys of the same locations as the satellite orbits around the Earth. It measures how those areas change, uh, how sea level in those specific um, areas in the ocean changes through time. Of course, the big advantage of these satellite measurements is that it actually spans the entire ocean, oceans. Um, the disadvantage is that we only have records that are, you know, go back a couple of decades. Um, tide gauges are on the other side of the spectrum. We have records that go back literally hundreds of years because measuring tides has been important for people for a very, very long time. So there are actually really good um, um, tide gauge records that are quite old, but they are, of course, limited to the coastlines. So there's a lot of research that goes into uh, inverting all of, using all of these measurements to infer how much global mean sea level changes. And here's a reconstruction of that global change over the last, the past couple of decades, past century. So we're looking at a graph here that takes us from the beginning from 1900 all the way up to 2018. And we have sea level here on the y-axis. And sea level has been um, rising over this ent entire time period. And sea level is increasingly rising over the last couple of decades. And here you also see in blue at times where we have observations from tide gauges. And in, in um, orange is the time when the satellite data started to kick in. What you also see on this graph here is the kind of main drivers for sea level change over these time periods. So in the early, in the beginning of the 20th century, the main drivers for sea level change are come from mountain glaciers melting and maybe a, some component of the Greenland ice sheet melting, but it's both of them are not too big. Over this time period where you see this kind of slowdown in sea level rise, this is related to actually the damming of water on land. So there is sort of a slowdown associated with major dam projects. And now the, the fast acceleration over the last couple of decades, there's two big components that are added here. One is that thermal expansion of the oceans starts to contribute a significant amount. So this is the, the oceans warming and therefore increasing in volume and therefore causing sea level rise around the globe. And the other important component is um, that the Antarctic ice sheet is starting to contribute significant amounts of um, sea level, oops, sorry, of sea level, or, or contributes a significant amount to sea level rise. Um, this here shows you the rates of sea level rise. And this, these are all rates of global mean sea level rise um, in the 20th century. We're at about a millimeter, a little over a millimeter per year. And over the last few decades, this is about three times, two to three times as much, three to maybe three and a half millimeters per year. And that's this acceleration that you see in these data as well. Now, I already told you that the, the big um, component that's really starting to pick up over the last couple of decades are the major ice sheets. And the major ice sheets is the Greenland ice sheet and the Antarctic ice sheet. This shows to you here um, a plot of um, ice mass loss from the Greenland ice sheet. So everything that starts popping up in orange are areas that are melting significantly. Um, and this is a time series going over, over the last couple of decades. And you see how really um, the Jakobs have an area here up in the Northwest around here, especially in areas where you have these uh, major outlet glaciers is where you, where you start to get increased ice melt and ice loss over the last couple um, of decades. And we see similar trends. This is just a screenshot of the, of the last kind of time slice of ice loss. Um, we see similar trends for Antarctica. This here is um, Western the Western Arctic ice sheet. This is the, the much bigger Eastern Arctic ice sheet. And um, there's a major melting going on in Western Antarctica in this area, which is the MNCC area, a little bit on the peninsula. But there are also areas where there's actually um, mass gain. Um, so these are areas where it snows more than it melts. So you actually 
Uh, we are actually accumulating ice mass in specific areas as well. But as a whole, the Antarctic ice sheet is melting and contributing to um, sea level rise as well. And this is, again, also something that's sort of picked up over the last couple of decades. So here is just these last couple of decades where we have a rate of about three and a half millimeters per year of sea level rise. And here's sort of the breakdown and then I'm kind of going through this all on a pretty high level, um, but here's sort of the breakdown of what contributes to sea level rise today, which is we have a total here, which is about three and a half um, millimeters per year. One third of that, about one millimeter, um, Yes, about one millimeters, one to one and a half millimeters is due to thermal expansion. So this is just the warming of the oceans. And two thirds, the other two thirds is associated with mass loss. So when I teach a, an entire class um, on sea level change, and this is kind of a number that I just emphasize because it's easy to remember of the present day sea level change that is that that is observed. One third is due to thermal expansion and the other two thirds are due to ice mass loss. And this is a combination from all ice sheets, the Antarctic ice sheet, the Greenland ice sheet and mountain glaciers. So we have three and a half millimeters of sea level change globally. What about if we go to specific locations? So next I wanna, I wanna talk to you about looking at, okay, this is sort of the highest, okay, on. On average, around the entire globe, sea level rises by three and a half millimeters. But what if we live in New York City? What if we live in North Carolina or in Florida? How much does sea level change there? Is it three and a half millimeters? Is it a lot more or a lot less? And it turns out that sea level change is really very strongly dependent on where you are. And I'm hoping to drive that point home as one of the take home messages at the end of the talk. So, here is this, the tide gauge record here from Battery Park in New York. We're looking at a time series um, from 1860 up to 2010. And we see sea level here in inches and you see the sea level curve is sort of this zigzag line. Of course, there's a lot of variability that's associated with tidal and seasonal var uh, variations, but you also see a pretty steady increase you see a little bit of an acceleration in this curve as well here. The global mean curves that I showed you before are a lot more smoothed out than these individual records. So the global trends are three and a half millimeters per year. What the rate that we have observed in New York City from, tide gauge, from the tide gauge is that sea level has risen by about 4.2 millimeters per year. So significantly, um, significantly larger than, than um, the global mean. If you move along down along the US East Coast, this will get, these rates will get higher and higher. So we're looking here at a map plot along the US East Coast. And now the rates are gonna, the exact numbers are gonna be a little harder to compare to what I just showed you because in the study, they looked at a slightly different time period. And I mentioned before, there has been this acceleration. So depending on which time period you look at, the rates will shift a little bit. But they looked at this from 1900 to 20, um, 2017. And they looked at um, data, data-driven sea level change. So this is from tide gauge records. And they found that sea level change in the north is about two millimeters per year. This is about what the global mean is over this time period. Then they increase to higher values, also in the New York City area, to much higher values around here, about four millimeters, so twice as high as up here. And then they de decrease a little bit again. And so you see sort of a general trend. You also see that there's also some variability still. There are some areas here where sea level is is um, sea level rise is quite a lot higher than in some of the neighboring um, locations. And I won't talk that much about these kind of smaller scale changes from one place to the next. Um, and I will talk a lot more, and I, but I'm happy to talk more about these kind of sm small variability that you also see a little bit within here, what drives that. But I wanna focus on the kind of bigger picture of what is seen here. And 
What they did in this paper here is like, they use the tide gauge data, but they also use the sea surface height data and they also use GPS data. And they this is their kind of data-driven um, sea level rate and they inferred it and they, they produced from that an inferred sea level rate. Um, and this is a kind of an inferred longer scale sea level rate. And this is the rates that they um, uh, invert for. So this is in a way just kind of a smooth version of what the data show you. And you see the same pattern that I just described. You see high sea level around here and you see much lower sea level um, towards the north and the south. And these are you know, significant amounts See, as I said, global mean sea level rise, I think during this time period is one and a half to two millimeters. So it's everywhere, it's a little higher even still here. It's about the global mean rate here, but it's about double the global mean sea level rise in these areas. Now, what gives rise to this pattern? One first clue is if we look at, move away from looking at tight gauges and look at what GPS, what a GPS antenna tells us how the land is moving up and down. Because what we find is that in these areas specifically, there's a lot fewer places where we have good GPS measurements over the same time period, GPS time series of the land. But in these areas where we see very high sea level rise, we also see significant land subsidence. So the land going down. In this area here, we see that less and we see that a little less to the south as well. Again, there's also some scatter to that pattern. Um, now on the right here is similar to, to um, this part where they essentially produce a long wavelength smooth signal of the vertical land motion. Um, uplift, I should say, this is all negative. So this is all subsiding. So essentially most of the US East Coast is subsiding and it's subsiding by two millimeters per year um, in some of these regions which is on the same order as the global mean sea level rise. So, okay, so we understand now that land subsidence drives a lot of the sea level rate signal um, because of course, if the land is subsiding and you're looking out onto the ocean, what you perceive or what you see is sea level or what this coastline experiences is sea level rise, but it's actually not driven by ocean volume increase, it's just driven by land subsidence. So we understand this part now, but what drives the signal? Why is sea level, right? Why is the land subsiding specifically in this area? And it's kind of less to the north and less to the south. And to find the answer to that question, we need to go back about 20,000 years and think about what the ice sheets have done on earth, not just for the last 10 years or last hundred years, but literally for the last hundreds of thousands of years. And I'm gonna play a video for you in a moment. What you'll see is um, you obviously see a global map here and you will see the ice sheets um, here, this Greenland ice sheet and the Antarctic ice sheet. You will see major ice sheets to start popping up. Um, and we're going through a time series here. We'll see a red marker, this will step through. Um, here's sort of a little inset that will have a counter of time on, uh, on the top, 416 K, a K is um, kilo years, so thousands of years. So we start 400,000, 416,000 years in the, in the past, and we're gonna step forward in time. This, will, this, this line kind of will step forward in time. And what you see plotted out here is the global mean sea level um, curve. So we will go from times that were, and the present is on the left, the past is on the right. We will go from something that looks like today to a much colder time period when sea level was an average about 130 meters below present. And we go back into what is referred to as an interglacial. And we go back into a glacial, interglacial, glacial, and so forth. So I'm just gonna run this now. You'll see the major ice sheets forming, major ice sheets being the Laurentide ice sheet which covered Canada, most of Canada and into the United States, um, as well as the Fennoscandian ice sheet, which covered Northern Europe and Russia. And you see the ice sheets are sort of oscillating. They are growing towards the glacial maximum. And then they are de 
decaying quite rapidly um, in, into the interglacial before they start growing again. You see sea level changing as a result everywhere around the world. You see sort of land bridges form. This has, of course, affects human migration. I'm going to just, let me see, I'm going to go back a little bit. Affects, of course, human migration and affects other parts of the climate system. You see the coastline here along Florida evolve, for example. What you also see, I'm going to jump here to the beginning of this time period. You see that there was this massive ice sheet here. And after it's gone, what happens is that sea level continues to fall in this area. And it falls because what happens here is that the land was covered by a major ice sheet. This major ice sheet is an is a extensive load on the Earth's surface, and it pushes the Earth's surface down. As the ice sheet melts, this area is rebounding, and as a result, sea level is, uh, is falling. And you see this really nicely during um, this pass into glacial here. It's a little fast. <laughs> but you see it rebounding here, and you actually see it here as well. I'm going to take you just to have a look at that. Yep, you see it in this region here as well as I step forward through time. So today we are, so we are going back. This is what's referred to as the last interglacial. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a little bit. Now we're going into the last glacial maximum and into the present and it's a present interglacial and you have these areas again rebounding and we very much measure this this is widely known we measure this today if you measure sea level change in hudson bay here for example or if you measure sea level change around Fenascandia, if you have a or if you have a gps station we can measure the land popping up by about a centimeter per year so much faster than the millimeter per year global mean sea level changes. So the earth is rebounding in response to the past ice load. This mechanism is called glacial isostatic adjustment or GIA for short. And the definition of glacial isostatic adjustment, this is gonna be as technical as it gets, is that it's the viscoelastic response of the earth's solid surface. So we're deforming the, the earth it also affects the Earth's gravity field. I'll get back to that in a second. It actually also affects the Earth's rotation axis. If you put a massive load on the Earth's surface that's not on the, on the pole or on the equator, the, Earth will, the Earth's rotation axis will start to realign. And the, the adjustment is the adjustment of all of these things, the solid surface, the gravity field, and the rotation axis, to changes in the ice load, so it changes in the ice sheet, but also changes in the ocean load because as you as the ice sheets grow and melt, they add water to the oceans or take water out of the oceans, and that also has a kind of a loading effect on the Earth's surface. So the Earth, over these very long time scales, flows and deforms. And Mike was saying in the introduction that I'm I study sea level, but also a lot of my work deals with understanding the deformation of Earth's interior, and this is exactly why this is really important. Um, because the, the ice sheets over these time scales deform the earth and we need to know what the viscosity is, what the elastic properties of the earth are in order to predict and, and, and model this deformation. So here's sort of the cartoon version of what I just walked you through. So we have ice sheets that press down on the earth's surface. What you didn't quite see just in this map view before is that as a response, if you have subsidence in the area where the ice sheet is forming, but you also have uplift in the periphery of these uh, of the former ice sheets, and these are referred to as the peripheral bulge of the, the, the ice sheet. During the warm period, during the interglacial, as the ice sheet is melting, you have rebound in the areas that were formerly glaciated, and you have subsidence. So you, here you have uplift, is because mass is conserved within the Earth's interior. During the interglacial, you have subsidence, so land is coming down in the periphery of the former ice sheet. And this is the reason why sea level along the U.S. East Coast is, is rising, because the U.S. East Coast happens to be spanning pretty much 
this sort of spatial range. So the US and the Canada, Northern US and mostly Canada were, were covered by a major ice sheet during the last ice age. And we are here exactly on this area of the peripheral bulge where the highest point is here about in the Carolinas. So this sort of high point here, which is where we see the highest rates of sea level rise just because the, this, the area is subsiding. Now here is a, uh, just to kind of round that out, here's a global map of what this, this uh, prediction looks like of how much sea level is changing today, just because there was an ice sheet, there were major ice sheets on earth 20,000 years ago. So we're looking at rates of sea level change, millimeters per year, in red are areas that where sea level is falling, or where the land is uplifting, rebounding. And in blue are areas where sea level is rising or the land is coming down. And this is exactly what's happening along the US East Coast. And this is a prediction of how much sea level changes without any present day change, without thermal expansion changes, without um, Antarctic ice melt, without Greenland ice melt, just, this is just a signal associated with the last um, uh, deglaciation. So sea level is gonna, rise along the US East Coast, independent of what we're gonna do. <laughs> so here's exactly this, um, the pattern that I just described. We, this is, we have post-glacial rebound here. We have rebound, that means sea level is falling. And these peripheral bulges are all around the former ice sheet along here, here, and to the North as well. And those are areas with, where um, we have subsidence. And as a result, we see sea level rise. Now, this is not going to accelerate. This is going to be a constant rate. It's going to be a very predictable rate, um, and it will decrease with time. So that's the good news. We, now, we have a pretty good understanding of what that contribution to sea level rise is going to be this century over the next 1,000 years, over the next 5,000 years for that matter. So we understand this component relatively well. Yeah, so this is, again, this comparison. Now, this is all the signal associated with the major ice sheets that were on Earth 20,000 years ago to the present. But of course, additionally, today, ice sheets are melting. All right, so we have an additional signal of sea level change associated with ice mass loss. But this, these uh, physical principles of glacial isostatic adjustment also equivalently apply to the present, the melting of the present ice sheets. So what does that mean? As an ice sheet melts here, we have a couple of different components. First, the ice loses mass. That means more water in the oceans, sea level rises. That's the most obvious one. Second, and this is the one we sort of just talked about, the, um, the, the earth is rebounding. And so therefore the solid earth is uplifting in areas underneath the former ice or underneath the ice sheet. And to conserve mass, there is some, well, one, to conserve mass, there's some flow of mantle material back to these areas, but also we're increasing the amount of water in the oceans, which leads to a little bit of subsidence. So this signal here means if we have a, a town close to the ice sheet, this was actually a graphic we made for a project that we have in Greenland. This is going to be Nuke. If, ice, if this component here causes a sea level rise in nuke, ice amount, we experience sea level rise. This is what we would expect. However, these areas close to the ice sheet also experience rebound, and they experience very significant rebound, which outpaces this amount of sea level rise. So actually, sea level falls close to the ice sheet because of this land rebound. Additionally, there's a third effect. And the third effect is that the ice sheet is so massive that as it changes in size, it actually affects the gravity field of the earth. And the gravity field is what determines the upper surface of sea level. If the, your water will always flow, will always flow to form a fall along the equipotential gravitational surface. So what happens is as the ice sheet melts, you actually lose a little bit of that gravitational attraction. So mass attracts mass, right? If 
that if the mass is um, decreasing, the gravitational equipotential surface would change and it will actually shift away slightly from where, from where the melt occurs. And this is an additional contribution that leads to sea level fall in close to the ice sheet. And all of these are, are significant contributions to the sea level signal close to an ice sheet. So ice loss causes sea level fall if you're far away from the ice sheet, but it actually causes, uh, sorry, causes sea level rise if you're far away from the ice sheet, but it actually causes sea level fall if you're close to the ice sheet. And it's to the degree that Northern Europe, as the Greenland ice sheet is melting, Northern Europe experiences much smaller sea level rise because it's close enough to the Greenland ice sheet. So we can map this out in space. So what you're seeing here is what in the community refer to as a fingerprint, a sea level fingerprint. So what you're looking at here are two maps and they show you how much sea level rises. We see the scale here, this is in meters. How, many, how much sea level rises if we have melt from Greenland or if we have melt from the Western Arctic ice sheet. And the amount of melt that is simulated in both of these cases is such that it, it averages to one meter of sea level in the entire ocean basins. So the, 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 oops, the volume of ice change is the same here and here. So what we see is that we see this red around the ice sheets. Now red is sea level fall. So if the Greenland ice sheet melts, Norway is gonna experience sea level fall, Northern UK is gonna experience sea level fall. And even big parts of um, Canada are gonna experience sea level fall. However, areas far away from the ice sheet are gonna experience a sea level rise that is, so everything kind of along this turquoise to blue areas that are gonna get uh, experience a sea level rise that's equivalent to the global mean and everything that's further away is going to experience a sea level rise that's even larger than the global mean because again we're conserving water mass here if there's not if there are less than the average sea level rise here we have more than the average sea level rise further away from it and the same holds true from the same kind of general pattern applies for antarctica so if the Greenland ice sheet is melting, we actually only in New York see 40% of that signal. So if one meter is melting, we actually, New York would only experience 40, 40 centimeters of sea level rise. Whereas if that melt comes from Antarctica, the same amount, we would experience about a meter 0.2 um, uh, of sea level change. So it's important where ice sheets were 20,000 years ago and how quickly they've melted and the, the pattern that that causes, ge the geographic pattern that that causes for sea level change. But additionally, depending on which ice sheet melts, we have an additional kind of very geographic heterogeneous pattern of sea level change that we need to account for. Okay. With that, I want to move towards the second and, and shorter part of my talk, which is just looking a little bit into the future. So we talked about what the rates of present day sea level change were and why they vary around the globe. Now, if we look into the future, I already mentioned that the, that the effects related to the last glacial maximum, we can model and understand quite well. What we don't really understand that well is how much the Antarctic ice sheet is going to contribute. If we know how much it's going to melt, we can predict what the sea level signal is here, but it's not, we don't know exactly how much of the Antarctic ice sheet is going to melt, how much and how fast the Greenland ice sheet is going to melt. So I'm going to show you just some predictions here for New York. Of course, you can find predictions, global predictions of whenever, in any location you're interested in um, online. But here's one for New York, just to give you a sense of scale. We're looking at time again on the x-axis here from 1900 to 2000. So we're around here. Well, I guess this goes to 2015 maybe. And future projections until the end of the century. And you see a scale of sea level in feet on the left and in meters on the right. Now what's shown in black is this tight gauge record from Battery Park. So we're back looking at one location. We're back looking at New York City. And, sea level, and the observed sea level change over this time period. 
Now we're going to look at some projections, and these are projections from the New York Panel on Climate Change, possibly. So this is kind of an expert panel that puts this together, which is then used in policy decisions for, for the city. And here are the projections that they have compiled, and they are compiled from different emission scenarios, different ice sheet scenarios, et cetera. And they predict that sea, they predict sea level change for the 2020s, 2050s, 2080s, and 2100. In all of these, you see these kind of funny looking markers. So what these are is they give us a sense of sort of the distribution of the likelihood of how much sea level is gonna rise. It's probably gonna be within this box. So here, this would be 50 centimeters, you know, 20 to 50 centimeters. And then these whiskers to the top and the bottom are also possible, but a little less likely. So it could also get as high as 70 centimeters here. Sea level rise predictions for the end of the century are 40-ish centimeters to maybe up to two meters. So this is not, so this is six, seven feet. But there are additional scenarios which are marked here as stars, which are referred to as the upper end low probability sea level rise scenario. So what is that? That means it's, it's probably sea level is gonna, this projection is probably gonna be in this box. If it's not quite in the box, it's probably within these whiskers here. But in the many simulations that have been run for this, these predictions, some predictions yielded really high sea level rise scenarios. Um, and they have very low probability, only in a few circumstances in the ice sheet models did they occur. But if they were true, if that was to occur in reality, this would have very important implications for the city. So these high end, low probability scenarios are really important for planning city planning, which is why they are shown here. And what, what is it in these ice sheet models that makes them form these really big ice out, uh, um, outliers with these high amounts of sea level rise. And what this is, it is related to the mostly the Antarctic ice sheet. How much is the Western Arctic ice sheet going to contribute to sea level rise over the century is sort of the big question. And also the Greenland ice sheet, to be fair. Thermal expansion, if we have projections of, okay, temperature is going to warm by X degrees, we can pretty well estimate how much thermal expansion is gonna to contribute to sea level rise. But we have a much poorer understanding of how sensitive the ice sheets are gonna to be to this increased warming. And for New York City, of course, any of these scenarios, this shows you the New York City, wider New York City area. And in color is essentially everything below three meters. So any of these scenarios will affect quite a wide range of the New York City area. So better understanding whether sea level rises by three meters or only half a meter would be really important. So how can we get at this question? How can we better understand how sensitive the Antarctic ice sheet or the Greenland ice sheet is gonna to be to warming? And this brings me to the last part, and I will finally take into the field, <laughs> which is that the approach that um, I and my group and a lot of other people use is that the, sorry, let me back up one for one second. The difficulty in the ice sheet models is that there are one, a lot of parameters that we don't know. We don't know exactly how slippery the ice sheet is on the back, what the heat flow is on the ice sheet, uh, at the bed of the ice sheet. But there are also um, physical processes in the ice sheet that we don't fully understand. How quickly and why do ice shelves fracture and, um, and break up? And how does that affect the, the ice sheet behind it. So there's a lot of ice physics parameters and, and even mechanisms that are not super well understood in the entire instrumental record. So when we actually have measurements and can go out and look at it, it was always colder than it is today, never warmer, right? So we really need to run an experiment with the Antarctic ice sheet in a warmer than present climate to understand what the physics is that drives ice sheet collapse and what the thresholds are in the ice sheet system. And one way of getting at that question is by going back into the geologic past during times when temperatures were slightly warmer to, to, than today. And we don't actually have to go back very fast, uh, very far. This is your entire geologic time history 
of four and a half billion years and all the way. So we are here, obviously, all the way at the end of this time period. We at the present and we don't have to go back very far to find Earth conditions where it was warmer, one degree C, two degrees C, warmer than today. Um, and in fact, we are going to look at a time period, the last the glacial, you actually saw it in that ice sheet history video. And this occurred about 125,000 years ago. Um, and again, on geologic time scale, that varies by millions and billions of years. This is actually super, very recent. So here's um, a, temp uh, a temperature plot. This is kind of a funky color, uh, funky time axis here, but it's a really useful one. This is the present day change. We're looking at temperature changes on the y-axis here. And there are some projections of how much sea level is gonna change in the future. But also it shows you how sea level, uh, how sea level, how temperatures have changed in the past. And the time axis is sort of shifting from each window here. Here we are looking at thousands of years, so 10,000, 20,000 years. In this next window, we are looking at 100,000 years, 300,000 years. In this time window, we look at million, 1 million, 5 million, 20 million, 60 million years. And you see that temperatures were naturally, of course, there were no humans around, but they were naturally warmer than they are today during these time periods for a variety of reasons. For this time, these time periods that I specifically look at, and specifically this time period, the last interglacial, um, it was warmer just due to its position relative to the sun, due to the orbital um, configuration during this, these 10,000 years. So during this time, temperatures were about one to two degrees warmer than pre-industrial values, which is actually what we're almost, we're about one degrees warmer than pre-industrial already. So we're very quickly approaching this, um, this amount of warmth. But what we can do is we can go back into the geologic record and try to understand how high sea level was during this time period. And it might give us some clues how it will evolve in the future as temperatures continue to increase. And you can actually find shorelines, paleo shorelines that date to the last interglacial pretty much all around the world. But I'm going to take you to one place where we can find those. I'm going to take you to the Bahamas here, which is where we've done a lot of the field work. So the Bahamas is this major um, carbonate platform here to the east of Florida. It is, some of you might know it from vacations, it's a beautiful place. It is really great for field work for the same reason that it also makes it a great <laughs> vacation destination, and that is it has a lot of sand. The, uh, having a lot of sand is great because this sand actually cements and petrifies very quickly and essentially turns into rock. And so we have a really good archive, a really good record of how things changed because sand dunes, beaches, um, and also submarine features just turn into rock and are preserved in the geologic record because there's so much um, carbonate project production, so much sand in other words. The other reason why it's good as a, as a vacation destination and for our field work is that we work a lot with fossil corals. We work a lot with corals, which of course great in the present and they're really great in the past because corals grow at a specific level with respect to at a specific depth with respect to sea level. And we can therefore use them as indicators for how high sea level was in the past. So I'm gonna show you some of these fossils. Here is a, an alive brain coral. And here on the left, you see a fossil coral. And this coral is 125,000 years old and it was covered with sand and the sand turned into rock. And you see these sand units here. We know at the time that this fossil coral was alive, sea level was higher than this because corals don't grow above sea level. And we also know that sea level is probably within a couple of meters of this specific coral here. So it's a pretty tight constraint of how high sea level was. The other great thing about corals is that we can chip off a little piece and we can take it into the lab and we can date it 
using um, isotopes, using the uranium um, thorium isotope system. This works very similar to carbon dating that you might have heard of. So one, there's a radioactive decay from uranium to thorium. The thorium accumulates, and by measuring how much thorium there is in there relative to the original uranium, we can get a sense of how long it's been dead in sort of a closed system. There are here a couple of other examples. So this is all from the Bahamas. Here's the modern analog, the living coral. This is an um, alcorn coral. And here is kind of that big major coral leaf. This is the fossil equivalent. Um, here is the staghorn coral. Again, this is the modern and on the left, you see the, the um, last interglacial equivalent. Of course, here, these are all kind of jumbled up. And when we do this field work, we need to be very careful. Are these corals actually in situ? Are they, do we find them where they actually grew or have they been transported? Have they been broken up? Um, so those are all kind of considerations in the field. There are other features that we can look for and use at, as clues of how high sea level was. Again, on the right here is the modern. You see these wave cut notches that form um, where tidal activity erodes the rock. And we can find this in the paleo record. Here you see this really nice notch of oops. So this is sea level was pretty much exactly here at the time when, this, um, when it eroded into this rock. These features are harder to date. Um, so they are better to tell us exactly where sea level was, but they're a little harder to date and put into context. So often we try to find a lot of different features. Here's another feature. Again, on the right is your modern beach, your nice kind of ripples that form pretty much at, at sea level. And here on the left is the last interglacial beach. You see these sort of ripples, they're a little bit filled in with modern sand here in between. And you find these all over the place. Um, and here's the last feature, um, sea caves, and also other kind of cave deposits. This is a sea cave similar to the erosional notch that forms where the ocean kind of erodes away and eats into the rock. And we can find these sea caves and you can actually see two, two different cave systems here that formed at two different times. So we try to, we look at, at all of these different puzzle pieces that tell us okay, sea level was higher than this. Here, sea level was exactly at this location, but we can't quite, uh, at this elevation, but we can't quite date it. So we try to interpret all of these different features together. Um, we survey them in the field with, this is a fancy GPS. This is a GPS antenna here. We need to know elevation um, very precisely. So this gives you elevation up to an uncertainty of five centimeters, a few centimeters. We have a drone here. We take a bunch of pictures. Taking a ton of pictures is great because we can, when we go back to the lab, stitch them all together and turn them into a 3D model of the outcrop. This is really useful for us because when we get back into um, the lab, we get the ages and we might wanna revisit specific sites and reconsider specific sites, measure everything here is totally geo-referenced one to another. We can measure specific elevations of features. Um, these models are also great for outreach. We actually have kind of virtual reality goggles where you can, that you can put on and actually walk across in 3D, walk across this outcrop, which is really fun. So we have done this in places all around the Bahamas. Um, this is just to show you this specific sea level data, but this is just to show you, we have data from different islands um, in 2019. We went to these specific islands and collected samples and measured um, elevations from these two specific islands. This is an ongoing project. We have more um, field work in Grand Bahama and then probably maybe in between here. It's a very nice place to do field work, of course, as long as there isn't a global pandemic. So we'll see, we'll see how it goes. Um, but we have more work to be done. But at the same time, we also have already collected sea level data from a lot of these places. Now we need to, if we have these elevations of our sea levels, now we know, okay, this specific location, sea level was two meters above present here. It was four meters above present here. It was one meter above present. Everything I told you in the first half of the talk is that 
sea level is different around the globe and it's different because of these effects of loading and unloading of the, the ice masses. And we need to correct for that. We model this process and correct that out of the data. And we infer how high sea level was during this time. And here's a, a time series that shows you our results. So this goes from 128,000 years, this is in thousand years, to 117,000 years. Doesn't, oops, doesn't matter exactly what these times are here, but it's all during this time period, this last interglacial time period. And we have sea level here on the y-axis. Again, this is now global mean, so this is corrected for any uplift or subsidence that happened in the Bahamas. And we find that sea level was probably around two, maybe higher, three, maybe up to five meters higher than it is today. It might slightly have oscillated here during this time period. So this, what does two meters, so what, so, okay, what does two meters, four meters mean in terms of if we think about how much ice comes from the Antarctic ice sheet, how much ice that comes from the Greenland ice sheet. So I just wanna put this in perspective here. So the Western Arctic ice sheet contains about five meters of sea level equivalent ice volume. That means if the entire Western Arctic ice sheet were to melt, sea level on average would rise by about five meters. It's about seven meters if the Greenland ice sheet melts. Uh, yeah. And it's about 55 meters if the Eastern Arctic ice sheet melts. So the Eastern Arctic ice sheet is much bigger. So we are, um, what we found is that if temperatures rise by only a few degrees, it is likely that sea level rises by few meters, maybe two to five meters. And a likely contribution is a combination of Greenland and um, and Antarctica. We're doing this uh, work in other places as well. And we're sort of starting to build because of course, is it now, is it two meters or is it five meters? That's a, that's a pretty big difference. And there's a, with more data, we can limit and reduce that uncertainty on the estimates. And this reducing the, the uncertainty on these estimates will feed back into these predictions. So I'm gonna just wrap it up here and bring it back to where we started off. Um, so these were caused by this a very instable Western Arctic ice sheet. Since we are only getting about two to three meters, wow, that's a lot of change from the Antarctic ice sheet. It's actually lower than previous estimates. So our from if you incorporate the knowledge that we've gained for the last glacial into the predictions, you'll probably be on a lower trajectory, definitely than these higher end members. And in fact, um, there's a study that came out last week or the week before, a super recent. This is going to be what's in the new IPCC report. Um, and they made predictions of the Antarctic ice sheet contribution over this century and a few centuries in the future for different degrees of warming. And these ice sheet models are calibrated with exactly the kind of data that I showed you with these constraints on the last interglacial, but also other war periods in the past. But the, the calibration target that they use is still pretty wide. So narrowing in on that is a lot of what I'm trying to do in my research. So I started off with this figure. Ho hopefully by the time now, while this is a, you know, a good plot to show in the beginning to motivate, it's not the most sensible plot to show because the sea level is not gonna rise by the same amount. So these places will not see three feet of sea level rise at very different times. Um, so sea level changes highly from one location um, to the next. And so I'm gonna wrap it up here. I'm just gonna give you one tidbit for everything I said during my, for every section of the talk. I talked about rates and drivers of current sea level change and specifically here, one third of sea level change comes from thermal expansion, two third from mass loss, ice mass loss. We talked about sea level change along the US East Coast and there's a very distinct pattern and it's associated with the collapse of the Laurentide ice sheet that happened over the last 20,000 years. I showed you some of the future projections for um, New York City, which can, you know, which obviously affect the shoreline very much depending on which scenario of ice sheet collapse you assume. And lastly, I told you a little bit about how we can work towards um, decreasing these uncertainties here. And in part, this is by 
going back to these past analogs and past warm periods to better understand how sensitive ice sheets were back then, which will hopefully give us a bit better picture of how sensitive ice sheets are in the future. And with that, I'm going to wrap up.